All right, guys, welcome, welcome to episode two of Seize the Moment podcast. Today we're going to talk about the ego and self-transcendence. So, and yeah. self-actualization. So I think that that's a really important concept because it's something that we picked up on last week and we talked about flow. And so today we want to talk about ego death, what it means to dissolve the ego, and what it also means to transcend the ego mm-hmm. in terms of joy, in terms of happiness, finding some sort of fulfillment in life, which was connected, obviously, to our first episode, which we called Accessing Flow. Yeah. And um, what's pretty interesting is before we even recorded this podcast, uh, we on... <laughs> I like, I like how, how, I'm like, oh, uh, Leon. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he, he was like, oh, hey, what would you want to do the second episode about? And um, he showed me this article he was reading. And it was really cool. It was by a gentleman named uh, David Brooks. And it was a really cool article. Um, it, it talked about um, this like, concept, this idea of the first mountain man versus the second mountain man. And what was he talking about? Well, what I understood is um, how he defined a first mountain man is, is um, someone who values um, themselves, kind of an individualistic sort of a perspective. Uh, they're a little uh, kind of selfishly oriented uh, towards um, ideas of um, success and I'm kind of blanking out here, actually. Maybe, yeah. maybe well, you can. Well, yeah. So the article David Brooks was writing a book, well, who already wrote a book, which is going to be published very soon, called "The Second Mountain." So he wrote a book about what it is to sort of differentiate between what he called the first mountain man or the woman, right, or the second mountain man or woman. And so the idea is it's these two sort of fundamental differences between, let's say, between cultures, right? So it's a sort of clash, one could say. So Mm. one says that, hey, you know, to feel good about myself, to be happy, I need to achieve. I need to sort of have, you know, this kind of a plethora of merits behind me. And so that's mountain one. And so mountain two would say, hey, you know what? Maybe this isn't going to be so good for me. Maybe this isn't going to make me so happy. So Mountain 2 says, you know what, maybe I need to focus somewhere else or elsewhere, kind of in the world around me in order to be happy. Maybe it's sort of by looking outwardly, right, that I can find joy inwardly. And so they call that the sort of the man of transcendence or the woman of transcendence, the person who sort of goes about or around or let's say outside of themselves rather to feel Mm. sort of of, um, what they call or what people would call everlasting joy. Yeah, so um, what was interesting was when he was highlighting what the first mountain man was, Mm -hmm. Uh, it was interesting that the way he explained it is um, the first mountain man or woman uh, tries to find happiness through successes or achievements and believes that through um, uh, whether it's, uh, let's say, um, going to college or uh, getting that career that you always wanted and uh, making money, a lot of money and uh, buying the fancy car and all that he uh, details that that's not very fulfilling like on one level uh, there is a certain amount of esteem uh, that you get from um, those kinds of achievements but it doesn't bring you joy because in a sense you believe that getting things and doing things will bring you that joy identifying with those achievements but um, what was interesting was when he brought in that concept of the second mountain man, mm-hmm. it's somebody who sort of transcended the need for happiness from doing and getting things right. uh, to kind of contributing and, and offering uh, value, whether it's to their community right. or to an ideal or to some kind of a cause. Right. And uh, he argues uh, that real fulfillment uh, comes when someone is behaving like the second mountain man. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, in order to... Uh, how do I put this? For example, in my own personal experience, right? Um, back in the day, you know, uh, what, what, what's the classic view? Okay, you, uh, go to school, uh, go to college. After college, you get a career. Right. Uh, you get married. Mm-hmm. You do this, you do this, you do this, right? And... Um, it's actually, it's a fine structure. I think it is important to have a structure like that, right. especially when you're dealing with a large society mm-hmm. and you're trying to kind of um, kind of give some sort of a guidance for where people can go. Right. Of course, this doesn't work, though, for right. everyone. Right. 
And so, I mean, interestingly enough, if you kind of think about what you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to become when you kind of grow up, right, isn't the point to be sort of a functioning and a producing member of society in the sense that you provide some sort of value to other people, yeah. right? So isn't that, if you kind of think about like sort of this original idea of what capitalism was, right? And so interestingly enough, capitalism was actually meant to be a system, right, which we don't actually have now, right, with this sort of, you know, kind of these monopolistic and, uh, you know, kind of sort of conglomerates, these corporations that band together and obviously kind of you know, sort of seize control of various areas of production. Mm -hmm. But what it was supposed to be was that it was supposed to be, let's say, you have this guy, right, who decides, okay, I have a sort of way of providing, let's say, my community with some sort of service or some sort of good, right? And so, but I need people, right? So I need people to, let's say, help me provide that service or provide that good. Or let's say I want to sort of bring, or let's say when it comes to providing goods, that I need people to help me provide these goods, but when it comes to services, because I feel like this is like, um, let's say this is a service that's needed by so many different people, and I'm only one person, then I can take people under me, right? So what they used to do is they actually used to take people as apprentices, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I'm going to use you in some way to help you pro to help me produce this good, and I'm going to sort of teach you how to use this, let's say, or kind of um, provide this service for people, but at the end of the day, right, the goal isn't actually for you to be with me for the rest of your life. For like your a mentor? mentor? Yes, yes, so they were sort of, exactly, so it was more like a mentorship. So the way capitalism was originally founded was, there was going to be this guy who really knew, or, you know, at the time, unfortunately, obviously women weren't very much involved but it was going to be this guy who kind of knew a lot about some something right and something really important and he was going to say okay i'm going to start this business and i'm going to provide this service and i'm going to bring a bunch of people under me and i'm going to teach them how to do it and then someday they're going they to go off yes them, no. right and so technically speaking when it came to capitalism you were supposed to someday become your very own business owner right yeah so you the whole idea wasn't to, for the rest of your life to have a boss and to work for somebody so kind of going back to this idea of the second mountain man, technically speaking, capitalism was sort of formed in such a way, right, where sort of you had your own business, right, and you kind of felt good about yourself, obviously, as the first mountain man, but you also provided a service for your community or you provided a good for your community that they absolutely needed or something that they even really wanted. Mm -hmm. But the idea was that you were important within that structure. But now it's like something kind of happened where we're like, okay, we don't really care what we provide for the community. We don't care about the services that, let's say, that not only we provide, but the services that, let's say, obviously people pay for. But what's most important is the bottom line. What's most important is short-term profits. So let's say back then, maybe because it was such a smaller kind of, or these were kind of pockets of communities and areas, it was easier for you know people to say, you know what, this guy's obviously selfish, he's obviously full of himself, right? And he's not providing a service, or at least he sort of watered down the service in some sort of way. So we're going to go to this other person. We're going to go to somebody else who provides a service that's much better or a good that's much better quality. Mm -hmm. But now, because of obviously kind of the monopolies that are structured and sort of the kind of um, the trusts that are formed, it's very hard to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's very easy now for companies to kind of say, you know what, we're going to sort of provide the services that we want or the goods that we want in whatever way we want them. And so when you think about what sort of our system or economic system was supposed to be like, it's actually completely antithetical to what it is. So we were in some way really supposed to have been, in terms of the sort of the theory or the idea behind modern-day capitalism, we were supposed to be much more community-oriented, and we were supposed to provide things and sort of services and goods that were really important and really significant to the people around us. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important that we're you know, talking about this. Because I think it's, I mean, I know that there's a lot of people who are definitely trying to bring people back to that kind of community-based mindset, right. uh, back to contributing. Um, also, if you learned anything, teach someone else. Mm -hmm. there, I don't know why I'm thinking about this right now, mm -hmm. but there's this, uh, I like to listen to uh, these motivational clips in the morning. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I hear, Get some I hear, kind of, yeah, get my yeah. subconscious full of no, really right. good stuff. So one of the things that uh, pops up is a, uh, like this mini excerpt of a speech from Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he says is, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase here, uh, is to kind of uh, build up your own skills, mm -hmm. learn, learn, learn as much as you can. And then when you've kind of learned the skills that kind of uh, transcend you past, you know, your, your own challenges and obstacles and things like that, teach someone else. Right. Uh, each one, teach one. You know, yeah, yeah, reach, yeah. reach your hand out and bring someone else up. Yes. And... I mean, that's in a sense what the purpose, I believe, of the podcast is in, in a sense because by discussing these topics, it's like you're kind of elucidating these, these ideas that aren't so common. Like sometimes it sounds like it's obvious. Like someone might listen to this and be like, 
So, so what are you saying? saying? Uh, you know, help, help someone, someone else and contribute, contribute to the community? Right. Okay. Why? Uh, well, okay, yeah, why? why? Okay, that's, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't even thinking that. They might just think, oh, it's a simple way. Like, but it's really not because, because if you think about it, we're inundated with so much stimuli. And they're, like, even also, there's also echo chambers. There's there's things like where people don't have access to certain kinds of uh, knowledge. And I feel like... The, being one of the people who kind of brings out uh, this kind of stuff is, is very important because, um, for example, talking about um, ego versus um, authenticity, like valuing, identifying with these things that you've done and, and, or, or this uh, sports team or, or with this uh, viewpoint in an argument or something like that and defending it to death versus like uh, this idea of authenticity like, oh, and, and like uh, – like uh, a deeper sort of identity. It's kind of not something that you kind of attach to all these different things. It's kind of something that has to do more with like community, thinking beyond yourself, thinking about contribution. And uh, believe it or not, I mean, in my own practice, for example, um, besides doing this podcast, I mean, no, actually, this podcast is, is definitely a way of offering value and contributing, which kind of brings me back to that idea of the second mountain man. Um, for instance, uh, one of the stories that, uh, David Brooks talks about, um, there's this mother who lost her son. Uh, the moment he died, it, it was, she experienced like a tremendous amount of suffering, Mm -hmm. but she kind of went beyond that suffering and decided, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna do something, uh, for for the community i want to i want to help out i want to make a difference and and like these these serious things that happen to us in our life it's i mean it goes beyond like these achievements that we care about and these things that we like to identify with there's there's real stuff that happens that really changes you and gets you thinking in a different way right Uh, you you, mm. yeah and, and sort of it's been said right with suffering by the great sages of kind of world history that suffering is absolutely necessary Right? It's like kind of suffering in vain is obviously not a good thing, but when you kind of suffer for a purpose, right? In the sense of something positive comes out of it. Then suffering in itself is building, it's growth, right? It's sort mm-hmm. of personal development. Where the idea is you take this particular thing and you take this sort of tragedy and you say, okay, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to allow this to corrode my soul or am I going to allow it to foster some growth? Or am I going to allow it to sort of help me become the person that I could be? And I think that that's what we talk about when we mean authenticity, right? Because authenticity is a sort of very kind of vague concept that obviously we, every sort of, I think, culture uses it to some extent. That we talk about like being real, right? Or being genuine. And it's like, it's sort of very hard to define, but I think that that, that that's what we kind of mean as sort of psychologists, right? Or as sort of as therapists or let's say, you know, people kind of in the self-help industry. We mean that when you talk about being authentic, we talk about being the best possible version of yourself. We talk about being self-actualized, right? What Scott Kaufman talks about, you know, the sort of 10 principles of self-actualization. And so, and I think that that's when you kind of put the two together, right? Sometimes what what trauma, what suffering can do is it can sort of help you become that kind of person, which you might have not have done otherwise. Because, I mean, we know, right, human beings are, and all of us, right, myself, you, everybody included, it's very easy for us to kind of sit back and say, okay, you know what, if we're not suffering, if life is sort of bad, then I'm going to, you know, sort of sun myself and take care of my own sort of personal, you know, physical needs, Mm -hmm. right? There's not really a reason to grow because everything is okay. But then, kind of like the hero's journey, right, you're sort of set off on this course based on whatever, you know, sort of whatever your trials are. And then that course, you get to learn something about yourself and you get to learn about your potential. And that potential, you know, we can argue sort of existentially speaking, is that authentic self. That sort of inner core that's in maybe, I would say, not just you, but in all of us, that we have the potential to actualize, right, based on these kind of principles of self-actualization, which kind of research shows over and over again that they're connected to happiness, right, they're connected to sort of physical and mental well being that they're connected to a sense of growth a sense of community a sense of fulfillment and meaning and so if we kind of put all of this together right i mean what it's telling us and i think that's what david brooks was alluding to was that this idea of us being sort of of us conceptualizing ourselves or being these individuals in this particular sort of let's say vacuum right if that's all we are if we're just like i'm gonna be here and i'm gonna make a lot of money and i'm gonna be happy this way i think that's just a false understanding of what it means to be human yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of the reasons that uh, we strive for those kinds of achievements is 
I mean, I feel like a lot of our beliefs are dictated to us by society. And I, I feel like, um, again, back to what I said at the beginning, what works for some mm-hmm. does not work for others. Yeah. And I don't know. I've tried the, the whole, uh, you know, having achievements thing. Um, and getting happiness from that, or having money, having this nice, uh, this nice watch or whatever, blah blah blah. Um, and I think it's okay to enjoy a watch if you like watches. Right, right, it's not right. the point. Right. But the idea is like to attach your self concept to these things uh, in order so that you can become bigger, grander, feel better, and all that. Yeah. It makes sense on the surface, but it, it truly in practice. Uh, and anyone watching this, if they've ever, and I'm sure a lot, most people have engaged in this, if not everyone, mm-hmm. you'll see it's not fulfilling. Yeah. But then, what was interesting is, um, ha- like for example, when I was exposed to these concepts of authenticity, uh, of, of contribution, mm-hmm. of offering value and all that, mm-hmm. it was actually very foreign to me the first time I heard of it. Right. But... It's interesting when you have a certain person, like, or, or there's like different ways to kind of highlight what authenticity is or why it's important and all that. But um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the book back here, we talked about it last time too, a little bit. Uh, Power of Now. It's the greenish uh, point. Yeah, there you go. Okay. It's harder when you're looking at the camera. But anyway, so uh, in that book, uh, one of the things that made me uh, kind of understand the difference between ego and mm, the real self being real authenticity whatever synonym you want to use right. uh, and by the way it was also my first time hearing that concept I didn't even know what the ego was mm-hmm. uh, oh my god now I want to say okay so right. let me just do this first I did when I first found out what the ego was I was I was just I was shocked I didn't understand okay check this out so I was thinking a lot right I used to be a very neurotic person yeah. I thought I was run by my thoughts yeah. but I didn't understand even that I was being run by my thoughts I would just kind of automatically be thinking things and kind of acting on it mm-hmm. I, I would uh, create stories in my mind and act on it mm-hmm. uh, I would interpret things uh, and then think that that interpretation was the real version of what's going on, and I'm correct, and I'm right, That's and all that. That's ego, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. but what was interesting is once I found out what the ego was, and it was from an interesting movie too. I'll have to, I have to credit the movie. Yeah. Uh, I watched this movie, Revolver. Yeah. And classic. Yeah, Jason Statham's in it. Yeah. And Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to um, do any spoilers. I'll try to do it kind of spoiler free, but pretty much. Um, the way that they showed how the ego operates in a person in that per- in that movie yeah. was fascinating. Mm-hmm. This the main character was having a self dialogue, and then okay, you know what? I'm sorry, I am gonna do a spoiler. <laughs> There's this scene towards the end of the movie yeah. where he has a self dialogue with himself. He's in an elevator. He's also claustrophobic. Yeah. So he's afraid of being in an elevator. Elevator gets stuck. Um, and he, he starts having kind of this dialogue with himself. And he starts to see that there's a split between himself mm-hmm. and these thoughts he's having that are kind of right. controlling him. and kind right. of controlling yeah. him. And all of a sudden, he starts speaking to the voice in mm-hmm. his head. And he says, you're not me. Uh, you don't control me. I control you. And, mm-hmm. and things like that. And not just that. The first thing that he says, which really resonated with me and mm-hmm. gave me goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Not to go on a monologue. Mm-hmm. It was kind of happening like right. that. Right. But what happened is, I got these, yeah, I got goosebumps when I heard that. As mm-hmm. if uh, something was being revealed to, like, it just felt like that for me. I don't know how other people feel when they watch it. But I'll say for me, uh, I started uh, feeling good and kind of strained. It also felt like this kind of a breakdown of, of all I kind of knew. It felt like... Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to call it a paradigm shift. And if you think about it, isn't that the second mountain man, right? The one whose ego sort of dissolves, as he called it. As called it. In that moment, right. that's for sure. Because the moment I understood that the voice in my head wasn't me. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of... I mean, I've done a lot of research on it. Mm-hmm. Um, for actually... Wow. So, how old am I? I'm do- of course, I know how old I am. But I'm 28. Mm-hmm. When I first heard about this, I believe I was... Uh, around 20 mm-hmm. 
And since then, so you could say like for a good eight years, I've been kind of researching what, you know, what are your, your thoughts? What is ego? Has it operated in you? How could you tell other people about what it is and kind of um, make it sort of a mainstream idea? Um, when, <laughs> yeah, when I found out that it's like that these thoughts in your head are kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like we're kind of semi-permeable sponges um, in the sense that what you're surrounded by, your environment, the people you hang out with, all that, what you watch, mm -hmm. media you're exposed to, music, da 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 da, da society, yeah. kind of creates what is that automatic uh, dialogue in your head, among other factors, biological factors. Uh, yeah, of, yeah, of course, you have a chemical imbalance, but barring that, a lot of these influences kind of dictate what that automatic dialogue is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but when I realized that that automatic dialogue was just not necessarily me, it's just kind of the same. It's like you can observe it. This is this this watcher of these thoughts, and that's kind of the concept that was brought up in Power of Now. The moment I also read this book and started saying that like a thought is sort of this bounded concept. It's uh, I'm holding the mic in one hand, so I can't do this very well. I'm gonna try. Okay, so just gonna. Carefully do this. Okay, actually, I'm just going to place the mic over here. Okay, so the way he talks about it, and the way I kind of visualize it is, uh, these thoughts are like these bounded structures. It's like, it's like something small. Like any idea is something small and just this bounded thing. But then when he describes like who you really are in terms of like watching these thoughts, it's as if you're something that's in a sense, boundaryless, mm -hmm. and something about that particular concept kind of struck me mm -hmm. and resonated with me, and kind of helped in my understanding yeah. of what how the ego operates in me. Yeah. There may be other things right. in either this book or right. David Brooks' writing, mm -hmm. or and, well, and yeah. you know why I love that I love that you say that. And so obviously, this isn't kind of meant to be offensive to anyone, right? Because I think that all of us struggle with this. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties for a sec. <laughs> no, no, I'm definitely listening. <laughs> go, 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 go. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so when we talk about kind of like, um, let's say who we, again, sort of this idea of who we are as people, right? <laughs> My check. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when we talk about like who we are as people, I mean, to a very sort of vast extent, like, you know, in all honesty, we have to admit that we are selfish, right? To, to a great extent, not fully, obviously, nobody's either fully altruistic or fully selfish. So when you talk about ego, right, a lot of what we do, a lot of what I do kind of in my work with clients is a lot of sort of cognitive behavioral work, right? So I'm sort of telling them or asking them, right, these sort of questions about their beliefs. So we kind of know, and we'll, we sort of see this from clinical psychology, right, from neuroscience, from social science. That beliefs essentially impact every single thing that we do. They impact all of our thoughts, they impact all of our, let's say, all of our behaviors and all of our feelings. And so that we go through our world and through our lives through this sort of in this cocoon of our beliefs, right? And a sort of expectations, which are obviously the different forms of beliefs. And so when we talk about the ego, right, it's sort of this idea that I believe what I believe and no one else is going to tell me otherwise. So if I'm thinking this, if I'm feeling this, therefore it must be true. My reality is reality. And I think that's what was so cool about what you were saying is that you were saying that when you were like that sort of in that kind of state which I promise I'm sure all of us are what at one point one right yeah one time oh, and probably oh, and even probably even after yeah. realizing that you can right. go and in and out of right it. and even like periodically and so we're so in our minds that we so, like we are so sure and that's what was so cool about that movie and what that scene meant right with Jake versus Jake where he's telling him like hey everybody's your enemy right I'm your only friend and it's so believable because it's literally your own voice it's the center of your own universe so how in the world can it be wrong? So a lot of what we do in therapy is like sort of not only challenging those beliefs, but sort of asking yourself, okay, if this is your particular belief, right? Why does it make it true, right? Is it just because it's your belief? Is it because your feeling is a feeling that it's true? Is it because you're experiencing the feeling that it's true? Is it because you're thinking the thought that it's true? How do we know that something is true? And so I think a lot of what sort of therapy is is sort of philosophy, right? It's sort of asking ourselves, okay, because we believe these certain things, does that really make them true? Because mm -hmm. we feel these feelings, does that make them true? And so a lot of the times with the sort of, you know, this idea, this concept of the ego, we actually feed into it. And that's what I think the point of the film was. 
to, uh, to sort of help us reframe it and sort of change our own sort of, let's say, our own kind of, our own not only just desire, but our own sort of pattern of feeding into the ego. And the way we feed into it is by literally accepting our thoughts and feelings as facts because they are. Right, because they are thoughts, because they are feelings, and because they come from us, therefore they must be true. So whatever we think, whatever what we say, they must be true. And that's so narcissistic. And we tend to do this periodically. And sometimes people just do it sort of perpetually, where they don't have any other way of thinking. And so in therapy, one of the sort of the foundation and the kind of starting points from where we work is essentially asking the person like, hey, okay, what do you think would happen if you actually just allow the thought to come and go? What do you think would happen if you allowed the feeling to come and go? Do you think that it would be there? Do you think it wouldn't be? there like how do you think that you'd react and you know sometimes people would say well I have no idea I've never done that before and then so when they actually do do that I just you know they're kind of like okay I'm not gonna feel you feed into it I'm not gonna accept it right because technically speaking and logically speaking just because a feeling is a feeling and a thought is a thought doesn't necessarily make it true and what they find is that when they do that when they just allow these thoughts to come and go and allow these feelings to come and go just like with you they're like holy shit I'm not a slave to them right I don't have to actually accept them and what we find out just like with Jake and the ego when you do accept the feeling when you do accept the thought is true obviously what's the result right you're you're prolonging depression you're prolonging anxiety right and it's like you're sort of doing this habitual or sort of um, let's say perpetually perpetuating this habitual feeling so, so, but there's yeah. a fatigue associated with that yeah like a mental fatigue you will actually stress yourself more by using your what's a good way to put this mental capital yeah to focus on things that may not necessarily be useful to you right and in people who do this a lot yep. that would lead to like a lot of issues and obstacles in their own lives yep. uh, hence why a lot of people um, are in therapy in the first place because a lot of these things that they think about ruminate over and believe are true yep. keep them from focusing on other things which have a better kind of opportunity cost and things that they could use that uh, that mental capital for to maybe offer value or right. contribute mm -hmm. and then actually f uh, through practicing that yeah. feel better right. you, you don't want to just tell somebody you'll feel better without saying try this because right. a lot of times uh, I wouldn't say it's a faith based thing but it's like I would say it's experimental and that's yeah. how I try to frame it so I mm -hmm. don't want anybody to ever believe anything I say so and I actually hate when people do that because that's a sign of dependence and I try to sort of steer them away from that. You want them to think for themselves. Yes, exactly. So and that's what cognitive therapy is, is this idea that, you know what, I'm going to challenge my own beliefs and even my therapist believes and I'm going to come to my own conclusions. Sometimes they'll be his, sometimes they'll be something else. But the point is that, let's say, when you have these thoughts and when you have these feelings, you're able to sort of what you said, right? And I love, 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 love that statement of being outside of your mind, that sort of Eckhart Tolle statement. Well, what you're creating is what's called an observing ego where you're sort of distancing yourself from your thoughts and feelings and saying, okay, I'm feeling these things, I'm thinking these things, what makes them true? How do I know that they're true, right? Is there an alternative? And if there is, right, how do I know that that's true? How can I know that any of these thoughts are true? And so you start thinking and criticizing in a sort of in a kind of positive and adaptive way, your own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And what most people come to find out is that, let's say, and sometimes you have like this sort of, um, of course, subset of people who are too positive, but for the most part, you have people who are way too negative and very cynical. And so what they come to find out is after examining and sort of, let's say, after examining and even challenging their thoughts, they find that, you know what, a lot of these thoughts are just not true. You know, I'm not these things that I perceive myself to be. And the world really isn't as terrible as it is, or sort of it is in my mind. And people are maybe a little more trusting. So it's like these experiences that I've had in terms of, let's say, my own failures or these experiences that I've had with being betrayed by people. They're, they're a very small subset of what life has to offer. Yeah, that does sometimes happen. But the thing is, when my observing ego is examining it, what we find is that, you know, it's a very small sample size of what life has to offer. Plus, I mean, um, we're probably not, we're not going to get fully into this uh, today for sure. But one thing that we definitely want to explore later uh, is, is nuance. Yeah, right? and, definitely. And, and uh, surface level thinking versus thinking at a level of depth. Right, right. And so, and just, mm -hmm. just, I'm sorry to cut you no, off, no, just no, to no, kind no. of promote our next episode. So we're going to have Jesse Manisto on the next show. And so she's a really, really fascinating per person. And then so her sort of main area of thinking and studying and sort of, of teaching is what's, what she calls, well, what we call kind of all of us, right? Divergent thinking. And she's like, and I can't wait to have her on the show. You guys are going to love her. She's sensational. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, right. So 
I mean, the idea behind nuance, just to just highlight it, is, yeah. is to think about something from multiple perspectives. Right. To kind of try to get as much of the whole story as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of the issue with being too identified with um, your thoughts or, or ego in general. Yeah. It's that you can believe one thing or a story in your mind, but it doesn't allow for you to perhaps think, for example, say you are having a disagreement with someone because of something that you believe in your mind. It's probably better if I had a specific example, but it's, it's fine. So say you're having an argument with someone, but then you decide, okay, I'm not just going to think what I'm thinking is correct. Maybe I'm going to try to see from their perspective why do they believe what they believe is true. Right. Once you do something like that, that opens you up. That also is another... I would I don't I wouldn't say this is a giant ego dissolving sort of a, a method, but mm-hmm. what is interesting is when you do decide to think, what is this other person thinking? What is this other person feeling? Yeah. Uh, how is my behavior influencing them? It kind of gives you a bigger picture. Yep. For, for instance, uh, there's a saying that I love from the comedian. He has passed away some time ago, but his name is Patrice O'Neill, and he was a very interesting guy. He said this thing that always stuck with me even to this day and still will. Uh, there's three sides to every story. There's your side, there's my side, and then there's the truth. Right. Once I heard, that's, that's, it's one of those things, like when you just hear it a certain way that resonates with you, mm-hmm. it kind of sticks with you. Right. Uh, that's also kind of why I like to reference stuff like that, not necessarily just, um, uh, yeah, I do like to reference sources from academia, but just to, you know, some, sometimes it's really weird. Sometimes it's a movie. Sometimes it's a comedian. Sometimes it could be George Carlin, for example. Now I'm thinking of, okay, let's, I'm getting a little off here. <laughs> but these uh, it's people resonate with certain people, and then it kind of pieces in these ideas and concepts into their world. Right. Um, I mean, uh, right. So uh, what, what was the, what's the point? Right. <clears throat> so when somebody is... Uh, let's say trying to, uh, oh, this is an interesting idea. Okay, there you go, it just popped up in my head. What would you suggest somebody who's really, let's say they're uh, very identified with their, let's say somebody's listening, right. they're very identified with what they think. Mm-hmm. They've heard some of the things that we've already talked about, right. but say they're, they're really in their head, but then they're interested in this idea. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, there's something beyond this. There's something like where I can observe my, I don't have to be run by my thoughts right. or, uh, th- is, this will make me feel better mm-hmm. and not just me it, it, somewhere down the line. I can do something for someone else and even that'll probably right. up my joy or happiness. Right. Um, what would you say is uh, a good way for someone to get out of their own way mm-hmm. ego wise? Yeah. So, I mean, what I teach my clients is something called the cognitive thought record. So what it is, it's a real, it's sort of a way of reinterpreting or re-examining the way you already interpret events. So the first part of it essentially, and it's sort of, it's, it's very kind of, let's say systematic, which people love because it's very sort of, um, it's very predictable and people really like that, right? So it's sort of a method that's scientifically validated and they can say, okay, it applies to everyone everywhere. So it would start off with you asking yourself first, what's the event, right? So what is the event that's in front of me, right? That I'm assigning a particular interpretation to. Right. So if let's say without this particular structure, right, the ego already believes that, hey, you know what? I already know what the truth is. Right. My perception is reality. And so this says, whoa, 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 hold on a second. How do you know that that's true? And so when you first start, when you kind of first start using the thought record, what you would ask yourself is, okay, so what is the event in front of me? And sort of this is what I used to use when I was like, uh, when I was a child therapist, when I used to see kids. So, you know, they would always come out and they would always come in pissed off about their grades. Like that was the thing, right? They would always be upset about their grades. So, you know, they would say, oh, well, let's say I received an F on the spelling test. And I would say, okay, so like, how is it that you're interpreting it? What is the meaning that you ascribe to it? And they'd say, what are you talking about? Like, what meaning? Like, it's an F on the spelling test. I'm angry. I'm so upset. Right. So for them, right, as obviously at that age, you would expect the ego says, no, no, no. Right. I don't even have to examine my interpretation. How old are they? 
So I used well. I saw people as young as six up until let's say oh, twelve. Of course, yeah. yeah. So, so if you could go to PSG right there and you right, 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 right. Right. So the so they're yeah, they're very a lot of them are self absorbed, which is like the point of development. That's they they are where they're supposed to be. The problem is when the adults are too self absorbed. When kids are, you forgive them, you understand. That's true. So so they would say like, what are you talking about? Like it's that on the spelling test, right? So it's like for them, it's like their interpretations are so real that there's not even an acknowledgement sometimes of what they are. They don't even have to. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, this this this. this this to me and so i would ask them okay so how would a kid let's say from zimbabwe react to this like let's say a kid from zimbabwe were given the spelling test right with an f you know with a big red circle and around it so and they would say well i don't know he probably wouldn't care and i'm like oh really why wouldn't he care oh well i mean right it wouldn't mean anything to him I'm like oh really why not oh well they would see a squiggly line and then other squiggly lines and then the big other squiggly line that's in red and then another circle around it mm -hmm. and i say right exactly so it doesn't mean anything to them because well they don't feel anything because of it because it doesn't mean anything is that them. because people is, is is there no school in zimbabwe <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's in English. I'm just sorry. Oh, because it's English. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's in English. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, why? Why would it not care? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Because it's in English, so they ascribe okay. no meaning to it. And then, so, so for them, right? And they're like, oh, wow. So that does make sense. And then I would ask them, okay, so what is the meaning that you're giving it? Right? What is the sort of interpretation of this app? And then right away, they would say something like, I'm a failure. Right, or disproves that I'm a failure. Right there, we have that core belief. Mm -hmm. And so, who we are is the sort of, you know, kind of, I don't want to say egotistical, but sort of, you know, sort of self, self directed, not even that's not a right term, but sort of self kind of involved, whatever. So I can't think of a better term. Sort of the self-involved beings that we are, we just automatically assume that what we believe about ourselves is true, right? And we don't really question it. And so when it comes to the star record, what it does is you start off from a point of meaning. You st well, rather, you start off from the, let's say, event, and then you go to the point of meaning. And then you ask yourself, okay, if this is the meaning that I'm giving this particular event, how do I know it's true? How do I examine it? What do I do to examine it? And so just to answer your question really quickly, so when, in order to examine it, you would really focus on the evidence against and for that particular belief. So if my interpretation of this, let's say, test event is that I am a failure, then I would say, okay, is there any evidence that proves that even slightly in your entire life that you had a slight amount of success? Because if that's the case, the sort of global generalized term cannot be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So by doing this method, they're kind of proving to themselves yeah. that their thought process might not be as accurate as they originally thought. Right. So question about the cognitive thought record. Yeah. Is this something that they themselves do? Like they'll write down yeah. an event? And yeah, then... right. So first I teach them how to do it. And then so unfortunately, and this happens for all of us, we're really, really terrible at critical thinking. So we all suck at this. I had to do 46 of these things when I was in school and I hated them so much. So it's deceptively simple. So when I teach them, right, a person might say, oh, wow, this is great. It's so easy. And I, they'll find all sorts of ways to fuck it up, just like I did. Or to not even do it. Yes, yes, that's a big thing too, or to not even do it. So, but the thing is eventually, well, so kind of going back to your question, what they do is, so they'll, they'll do it on their own after I teach it to them, and then they'll bring it into session. Because what happens is, since we're not, you know, kind of naturally born or natural critical thinkers, that it's very hard for us to learn how to become critical thinkers. So people engage in all sort of dysfunctional thinking styles, right? Sort of um, distortions, what are called cognitive distortions. So in their minds, right, they think that these distortions are accurate. Remember, because the ego knows everything. So if these distortions are accurate, what does that do? That that reflects in the thought record. So it's actually possible for a person to write something like, I'm a failure, find all of the evidence in the world for there being a failure, and find no evidence against it. So that's what's called mental filtering, when you're only focused on the negative parts of your life, but not the positives. Uh, right. So how about this? Mm -hmm. What if, along with uh, having a um, cognitive record, mm -hmm. what if uh, somebody also decided okay and i'm gonna put like what are the positive things what, what are the positive ways i can think about this right. and what are the negative ways i can think about it mm -hmm. and then maybe weigh those two what do you think about that is that I mean, is that strange am i like tagging I mean, on something that shouldn't be there i mean or? that could be a good way of thinking it but my only sort of 
my only kind of qualm with it would be just because my point in terms of like, well, any sort of cognitive therapist point is really to help people see things realistically, not so much positively or negatively. So I'm actually against positive thinking as I am against negative thinking because there is such a thing as being too positive. So no, of course, then you'll have uh, blind spots. Yeah, to right. Then life is pain like, and suffering, yes. which is a real aspect of life. Right, and life becomes very magical. That's great in your kind of deluded mind, the deluded way of seeing things, which is very egotistical too, because it's like oh, another form of ego. Yeah, right. And then you don't really sort of see what's in front of you. And sometimes people have this like in relationships where they're like, oh my God, why did she break up with me? I don't understand. Everything was going so well. But it's like, no, dude, she told you a million times that you weren't attentive, that you were selfish, that you were this, that, whatever. And you were just like, no, everything is great. So positive thinking can sometimes, or not always obvious. Well, then to address that issue that you just said moments ago where somebody might just put down how they think about something right. uh, and then not find a a way of thinking not against it but rather another way of thinking about it what would you suggest because that's the reason why I thought of putting down positive versus negative yeah. ways to, uh, what would you suggest somebody do in that particular case like <laughs> we wouldn't want them to stop there if sure. they can't find another way of uh, mm -hmm. thinking about a situation or event. Well, I mean, so if it's kind of in a broad sense, like let's say if you're asking them, okay, so can you list like mental filtering, right? So mental filtering is sort of filtering away all of the positives in your life. And so if you were to ask them, okay, like let's say right now in this particular period, you have all of the negatives down, and then on the other hand, let's list the things that you're grateful for and the things that maybe other people don't have. I think that's excellent. Okay. So when you're listing things that are positive and negative that are real, right, that are factual, that's an excellent exercise. So one thing uh, I want to say to anyone watching this, if um, if they find this concept interesting, they want to try it, maybe just, because here's the thing, a lot of times, even uh, myself, uh, even yourself, anybody, yeah. there's sort of a resistance yeah. to asking, like to even going down a piece of paper, especially if you're not used to it, mm -hmm. writing down, you know, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about something or an event, and then detailing how you think about it and ways to think, other ways to think about it. Yeah. Um, because, so what I noticed is that's an aspect of ego, yeah. actually, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, oh, I love that. I love that. that. I love that. Yes. Whenever you do some, okay, so here's the thing I want to say do you, for sure. Do you have an idea of why it's uh, an aspect of ego? What do you think? Well, here's the thing. Uh, so it's an aspect of ego because you kind of have an idea of how the world works. Right. And you have this sort of, con like this map or model. Anything that goes beyond the map or model, you'll tend to go into, uh, a, you'll have a feeling of resistance. Yeah. Now, a lot of people, when they have that feeling of resistance, they stop right there to maintain and preserve the map and model they currently yes. have. Mm -hmm. Anything against it, they will kind of nix out and have blind spots. Yeah. Or, or just, they try it, but because it doesn't feel right, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't do it. But the thing is, I would say to anyone watching this, You'll be surprised, and maybe nobody's told you this before. You know, so no problem. <laughs> but to anyone yeah. who's <coughs> listening for the first time, yeah. you're supposed to feel um, a little bit uncomfortable or some kind of resistance yeah. when trying something new mm -hmm. that goes against what you're currently doing. Yeah. But when you stick with it, though, what's interesting is depending on the challenge that you're taking, let's say... It, this goes back to our first episode, actually, mm -hmm. uh, for flow. Yeah. So if somebody tries something like having a, co uh, one more time, what is that called? Oh, a cognitive, cognitive thought record. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is trying to uh, use that method mm -hmm. and they feel a little bit of resistance, I would tell them, try it anyway, go, f let yourself feel that resistance, and you'll be surprised that once you start getting into the motion of trying this particular method, yeah. you'll actually find that it, 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 because it's not too challenging. It's yeah. just going on a piece of paper, yeah. writing some stuff down about what you think. Yeah. I, I think that you could go into flow, which we discussed right, right, right. that last episode. Right. And then you that's actually, the observing ego, I would say, too. And you kind of deepen mm -hmm. your yeah. character, I, I see, which is, yeah, which is ego. Okay, but. Ego doesn't necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, that's another thought, but that's... Mm -hmm. But well, no, it's it's, it's self-preserving, right? But the idea is that let's say when it's in a sense too self-preserving. So like the main issue that I have, let's say with when people, well, the main problem that I have in therapy when people don't want to do the cognitive with the thought, cognitive thought record is that it, it's sort of the resistance is really in a sense 
so self-preserving, right, that it's detrimental because what they are preserving is their identity. So if I have this set of core beliefs, in a sense, it is a part of who I am, right? I, I am my beliefs, my beliefs are me. And you don't want to not be you. No, right, exactly, right? And you think, and you also don't want to be, yes, that, and then also you don't want to be stupid or you don't want to be wrong. So the idea is that when we talk about ego and the resistance, right, it's sort of the cognitive thought record is a way of humility. So it's like, it's not only just accepting that, okay, I have a better way of being or a better way of living or a better way of sort of feeling but it's that you know it's that I have a better way of sort of well yeah better way of feeling better way of living better way of sort of seeing the world right but it's also like you know what I have a humility with me too so the be the kind of beauty of the thought record is it's not it's not well no it is it is that you challenge your thoughts right and then you change your thoughts to sort of more healthy ones right to more realistic ones that make you feel better about yourself but it also allows you to be humble and it allows you to say you know what like holy shit like I was so wrong about so many things and if I'm wrong about all of these things about these core beliefs which are so deeply ingrained in me then what else can I be wrong about right and you can kind of go out into the world and become better in your relationships you can become let's say more humble academically professionally but the idea is you realize you know what it's okay to be wrong because sometimes when I'm wrong like good shit happens right I feel better and that's like and that's the dissolution of the ego in a sense and so, sorry, just one more thought. And so the way to kind of, and the best thing that I see, like when people use the thought record effectively, is literally when they say to themselves or when they say to me in session, something along the lines of, you know what, like, wow, man, holy shit, I was so wrong about the way I thought about myself. But like, I'm okay with that. Right, and I'm okay with that because I see that being wrong is not necessarily a bad thing, and that's pure ego. It's this idea that in order to feel good about myself, I have to always be right. In order to be smart, to be intelligent, to be knowledgeable, I have to be right about everything all the time, and that is absolutely not true. And so, interestingly enough, I'm reading this really, really great book, and just as a kind of final oh. thought on this, called Down Girl by Kate Maine, who is this really wonderful philosopher, you know, academic kind of feminist scholar from Cornell University. Oh, yeah. You're me. yeah, and then so she has this. Uh, um, kind of in the beginning in the prologue to the book she talks about how you know she started devel developing different concepts for the book and then you know like as she went through different lectures and sort of had different feedback from people her ideas actually changed and that's what sort of intellectual humility is and that's what I think what authenticity is I think that's real right saying to yourself you know what there's no possible way that I can be right about everything which is why sort of these labels, like, you know, intelligent, smart, um, kind of knowledgeable, whatever it is, they're, they're so toxic. It's like whether they're negative labels, whether they're positive labels. Well, identifying with Yeah, the right. There's a reason to have labels. Yeah. I get it. But, I get but, it. but here's the thing with yeah. labels. So labels are good and accurate when it comes to thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? How conducive are they to our success, right? Did this behavior bring about this outcome? No? Okay, so the behavior was a failure. Excellent, right? I am not a failure. And I'm not smart. And I'm not intelligent. Because you know what? If I have to hold on to that label, what that means is I'm not going to take very many risks. I'm not going to try to make mistakes. And that's what was so cool about Kate Maine. Because the thing is, she had this idea, right, for this foundation for a book that, like, was an evolving sort of, was an evolving organism. That she went out into the world, right, with people who weren't PhDs. And she was like, wow, holy shit, you guys, like, literally changed my mind just based on this lecture that I had, based on the questions that you asked me based on the feedback that you gave me. And I think what it is is that when we talk about the authentic person versus the ego, right, the authentic person is able to say, you know what, I prefer community and I prefer actually being of service than I do to sort of fueling my own self-esteem or my own kind of, let's say, vanity. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing I definitely wanted to say, just in case, because this, this came to mind actually a little bit ago, I just remembered it now. Yeah. Is uh, I just want to make a distinction between, um, so for example, say somebody's uh, in their head, aka thinking a lot, yep. and identifying with those thoughts. Yep. The automatic thoughts. I want to draw a distinction between those th those thoughts that kind of come to you, not through kind of your conscious control, right. and then actual brainstorming. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone listening, just in case, please. If you're brainstorming, you're trying to figure out a problem or something like that, you're going to be surprised. I myself had confusion with this a long time ago. Right. You're trying to brainstorm, you're trying to think through something, you want to plan for the future, all of that. Please think and please critically think and please break down what you need to break down and plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, the thoughts that come to you uh, in a state of... I don't want to say scarcity. Let me put it to you this way. It, the thoughts that come to you... Just one moment. <coughs> no coughing on air. 
<laughs> it's so toxic what I'm talking about. No, uh, it's the pollution. It's the pollution. <laughs> so yeah, the thoughts that come to you automatically that aren't necessarily good for you or or, or story that you may identify with that is objectively disadvant- disadvantageous to you. Those are the ones that I would suggest you don't identify with. Practice, the, uh, for example, uh, one more time because I, just like the listener, <laughs> it's uh, okay. the cognitive, the cognitive mental record. Well, it's, it's called the cognitive thought record. And you can, cognitive thought yeah, record. And you, and, you. and you can literally find these things almost anywhere online. So you could put in the, new, <coughs> let's say the Google search. You would put in, let's say, what is it, psychology.tools, cognitive thought record, and you'll have a bunch of them pop up. And they're virtually all the same. So they kind of, what they do is, again, like, you know, what we talked about earlier, so you put in the negative thought, you put in the event that's associated with the thought, you put in the emotion that's associated with the thought, and the different evidence for and against that particular thought. And the other important aspect of it is you figure out which distortion, right, you're engaging in. So Mm -hmm. the idea, let's say, if the belief is I am a failure or the negative thought is I'm a failure, which is the same thing. It's a core belief as well as a negative automatic thought. So essentially what you're doing is that you're saying, okay, you were asking yourself what kind of thinking style is this? In this case, it would be labeling I'm a failure over generalization because I'm defining myself globally by this particular label, Mm -hmm. right? And it's also a form of black and white thinking, whereas the idea is that it's either I'm a failure or I'm a success when there's so much nuance in between. Right, which is like a whole topic in itself that we're going to cover in the future. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I'm surprised we didn't talk about, mm-hmm. which is, I'll just bring it up, why yeah. not? Um, I think that if, let's say somebody wanted to make that shift from um, operating from the ego right. to, let's say, uh, a real sense of auth- uh, authenticity or s- real self-esteem, right. um, meditation actually helps. Yeah. Um, in practice, when you are meditating, there's different styles of meditating. Yeah. But one definition I don't mind, it's very simple. We'll just keep it simple for now. Maybe one day we'll do an episode on meditation. Mm-hmm. Like to really expand. Well, like a mindfulness. A mindfulness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And there's mindfulness meditation. Yeah. There's other kinds as well. But in general, I, I've heard a definition before that actually is pretty simple. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, paying attention without thinking. Right. Uh, the more somebody practices that, the more they kind of build up that ability to maintain that kind of focus without yeah. thinking. Right. Thinking, again, why I brought up that distinction before, mm-hmm. is our most is one of our most useful tools ever, 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 ever. Right. We wouldn't be even in a how like you know the things that steps and the long term thinking that are involved in structure in building up society. And making a house. Uh, I don't know how this uh, table. You don't see the table. I don't know how this mic was made, but you know somebody definitely thought about how to make it and took all the stuff. So thinking is beautiful. It's a beautiful gift. The problem is those things that those thoughts that come to you automatically. Mm-hmm. Meditation, for instance, is a fantastic way mm-hmm. to get out of that, mm-hmm. and specifically just that. Once upon a time, I used to, I practiced meditation, but I actually made the mistake Mm -hmm. of completely walking around Mm -hmm. with a blank mind. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. (laughs) Here's the thing. (laughs) It was, it was, it was beautiful. It was great. I really had no problems. Here's the issue. Uh, I didn't make that distinction between thinking about while brainstorming and then, you know, those thoughts that come to you automatically. Right. Uh, it's very important to think critically <laughs> yes. and to plan for things in the long term and all that. Otherwise, you can make the state, you know, right. whatever. Long so, story short. I yeah. think you're saying that thoughts aren't your enemy. Uh, thoughts are not your enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh, only the thoughts that kind of come to you automatically that um, are too distracting, kind of have, and also that capacity that we have to identify automatically. Right. If you could just cut that. Uh, ident- the, the specifically identification with uh, thoughts. Right, because technically you are not your thoughts. And I would even argue that you are also, I mean, this is a whole other subject. You're not your mind, are you going to say? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're definitely, your mind is a part of you. But I mean, you're not okay. your traits. Because if you think about it, right, personality fluctuates, number one. 
And number two is any sort of thing that you believe, any kind of positive thing or negative thing that you believe you are, you can't be that all the time, everywhere, throughout sort of your history, right? So it's not possible. Like, it's not possible for anybody to be a failure. Just like it's really not possible for anybody to be a success, right? Because, and that's what David Brooks, and I'm glad we finally came back to this article that we started from. So that's what David Brooks talks about, that success is not perpetual. So when you're on that first mountain or when you're sort of embodying this first mountain idea, that the idea is that it's because it's like sort of, um, what do they call it? It's like perpetual progress. I'm always progressing. So if I'm a success, what that implies is that I always have to be progressing. If I'm intelligent, that means I can never be wrong. I can't make a mistake. I'm always learning. So for him, he says essentially what success is that like it eventually falters and you eventually kind of hit this drop and you're like, holy shit, I was not expecting this. So now my whole identity is shattered. So that's so important, I think, in terms of kind of just, you know, sort of therapy, clinical psychology, personal development, just even thinking about ourselves, is to remind ourselves that we can never be these labels, because these particular labels, right, they make sense when we talk about our actions. So you were successful at, right, let's say I was successful at winning the World Cup with my team. I was sort of successful at attaining an A, right? I was successful at this lecture because, you know, I got really great feedback. I was successful in book sales, right? This book did really well. But I'm successful? That doesn't make any sense because you know what might happen? Your next book might be shit. The next year, your team might not make the playoffs. And maybe one of your lectures is so bad that literally nobody decides to come back again, right? For whatever period, you know? So the idea is that if you're sort of, if you're harping on this idea, this sort of, or these various labels of yourself, eventually they're going to fall through because life is so unpredictable and so chaotic that you can be successful some of the time and then you'll also fail. Well, that you can be successful some of the time and you just have to accept that as a fact of life, that sometimes you'll actually fail. And that that's okay. That's who all of us are. We're some combination of the two. And I think that that's what David Brooks was talking about when he talked about these sort of two mountains. Because for him, right, this first mountain, why you can why it's not... Why it's not sort of a great avenue for joy is because literally it's unsustainable. So the second mountain is this idea or this ideal of being a significant part of your community. All you have to do is just want it. If you want it, you can become a significant part of the community. If you want it, if you sort of have the desire for it, if you genuinely find and sort of create a way to help people, you can just keep doing that and people will love you for it. But if you're talking about sort of academic, career, professional success, it's not sustainable. Eventually, you'll either hit a plateau and you'll say, oh my God, I don't know where else to go. I've hit the sort of peak. Or you'll have some sort of fall where you'll lose your job. The company will go out of business. You'll be too old, right? You'll sort of, uh, maybe the field is out of business or like, I'm not out of business, but kind of, um, let's say, out of outmoded or outdated. But the idea is that if you overly identify with not only your thoughts, but your particular career, your success, whatever it is, that it's not sustainable because it's just not how life operates. And just to um, draw another distinction, yeah. there's absolutely nothing. In fact, achieving yeah. is fantastic. Right, we're it's doing that. We're trying to. Oh, yeah. Right, right. No, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, for someone... For example, that distinction between the first mountain man who's kind of self-centered, uh, more individualistic, has individualistic concerns, it's, right. it's a kind of a meritocratic sort of a, a mindset, right. uh, just bit, everything, your identity is kind of, bit, or your values based on your ability to, uh, your, your ability and your achievements, right. versus that second mountain man who's about uh, community, offering value, uh, family, connection, right. qualitative, um, qualitative results as opposed to quantitative results um, I think like it's important to not just see a like a difference between those two uh, people and then try to strive to just be that second right right, right I think that it is important to still value what's what the first man right. the first mountain man mm -hmm. values yeah because, I don't know, I, I don't want to give people, uh, for example, the wrong idea. I don't want them, for example, say somebody's like, oh, okay, I'm going to contribute to the community. Right. Fantastic. So, th I'm, I don't need to be in uh, college anymore. I don't need to uh, go for this success. It's not right. going to fulfill me. Right, right. I might as well just like, uh, you know, uh, do, uh, I, I can't even imagine right. what it is. But, but what, the thing is, like, yeah. I don't want them to drop what they're doing. It's yeah. not the point. It's better to find that place in yourself, I yeah. think. That you can align with right. um, those quote unquote better principles that right. uh, are highlighted in the article, you know, uh, for right. being the second right. man. 
and, and I think maybe what he, the point of his article and his book, right? Essentially, the upcoming book that's coming out. I think the point of it is to essentially find a way to find a middle ground between the two, right? To sort of merge the two together, mm -hmm. or it could just be to sort of bring, integrate it, right? To integrate yeah. it, or it could even be that the second mountain man, right, is not so much somebody who doesn't care so much about achievements, but is somebody who uses those achievements, right, to further their community. So, which is the way I kind of interpret it, right? So it's like this idea is not that I'm achieving, right, for solely for me, right, but I'm achieving for all of us, right, for all of us to become sort of better equipped. And I think the thing, or the point that he was making in terms of joy, I don't know, it's like, when it comes to the, the first mountain, man, the idea is like, okay, that these achievements will make you happy, but they're only going to be so kind of limited in terms of the amount of happiness and the sort of time frame of the happiness that you'll experience. Whereas with this, right, with community, which is, you know, a combination of intimacy, which we need, right, this sort of connection with other human beings and like, um, let's say, and service, intimacy and service, that that's more sustainable. That this joy, right, is way more sustainable because it's something that not only you can control, but it's connected to your particular needs to be of service to be of importance right and to be intimate sort of connected with other people whereas the first joy it's like okay you'll have achievements right but the thing is as human beings we're limited eventually these achievements end you can't just continue to achieve and achieve and not not that the achievements will end that's not actually true because you can always achieve more but achieve higher that's hard Maslow's right Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, right comes to mind for some reason right because you kind of uh, those individualistic yeah, uh, it's a pyramid. Concerns. Yeah, and uh, there's a top. And there's a top. There's which a top. Self actualization. Right. right. Actually, and I. And I, there was some article that said there's another level beyond that. I didn't... Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, because, I mean, if you think about, like, let's say, becoming a CEO. Okay, let's say that's your goal. Okay, then you become a CEO. You get to enjoy it, and then eventually life becomes mundane again, right? There's not much more you can do except for gain more money. But then if you're gaining more money, you're not really achieving more. You're just doing the same as what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. So if you think about achievement, the point is, I think, that when it comes to community, right, you're always affecting people, right? And you're always sort of, let's say... You're affecting the way they feel, you're affecting sort of their health, and that's something that's sustainable, right, because you can always help make them better, or you can always help sort of sustain their level of joy and physical health, whereas when it comes to achievements, the idea is that, okay, eventually it stops, right, eventually the P, or rather the levels, right, sort of a plateau, and then you're like, shit, or you just, you fall down and you get fired or whatever it is, and then you have to reassess what the hell the point of life is. So, um, about what you just said, mm -hmm. um teaching these ideas to or, or or helping somebody right it goes back to that idea at the beginning of mentorship yeah when you are able to help someone right you when you feel good like in my own practice whenever i've helped anyone or contributed or anything like that i felt great yeah the purpose of helping them wasn't to feel great yes when people tell you that you will feel good from helping others it, maybe if you're not already doing that Okay, that could be your focus, but you'd be surprised like when you're actually in, in the moment helping someone. Right. You don't necessarily care about that, but as a symptom, you, you feel good. Uh, what's interesting is when you help someone and you teach these kinds of ideas to them, right. and let's say now they're better equipped, then they teach someone. Yeah, and then that person teaches the them. ripple effect. And and you're, yeah, your sort of your ideas and kind of your 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 spirit in some way, not in any obviously religious sense, but in some sort of secular way, right? Your spirit kind of reverberates, right? Or sort of it kind of yeah, it ripples. It sort of just ripples out, and then you live on. It's fantastic right. because even for example, the reason why we're even doing this podcast, right? There's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but. Um, if it weren't for certain uh, trailblazers paving the way, uh, I mean, one, one person, person, for instance, instance yeah, sure, Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Another person I could think of. Let's do Sam Harris. Okay. Okay. I like Jordan like Peterson. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You'll get a lot of hate for that one. Uh, well, from a uh, political <laughs> psychology perspective, Jordan Peterson. I'm not talking about his political views or anything like that. Please. Whatever, <laughs> it's fine. And by the way, Give that's why we got to talk about nuance. Yeah. Because uh, just try to think of it from any perspective. Assuming I have a good intention for why I bring it up, just assume it's a, there's a reason why I brought it up. Uh, he has a very interesting way of thinking, like from a psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so many uh, thought leaders, yeah. so many, so many, whether it's in the self help industry, in uh, psychology, philosophy, uh, so many people kind of trailblazed the way, and uh, Alan Watts, for instance, right? Um, this idea of uh, uh, back to that first minute. There's this one video he does where it's like, what would you do 
if money were no object, mm -hmm. what kind of life would you live? What kind of what would you really want to do? Mm -hmm. uh, when I first heard that video, I was it was early college, and it really was one of the videos that changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, and it got me thinking a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I, I really resonated with what he said. Yeah. And that's an idea of what I was just talking about, about that mentorship thing. Mm -hmm. that, it's, a, it's not a person that I can interact with, but what's interesting about the technologies that we have today, mm -hmm. and, um, and I wanna bring in this other concept. I feel like I'm going a little tan tangentially here on several areas, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a saying that you're the combo of the uh, five uh, closest people that you hang out with. Your personality is sort right, of, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting is, say um, your environment isn't that great, mm -hmm. but you started listening online to all these different thought leaders, mm -hmm. and you kind of made a big portion of your day, or some portion of your day, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that would tremendously influence the thoughts that come to you automatically. Right. Ah, right, okay. So, so remember, okay, so <clears throat> cognitive thought record. Yes. Correct? Okay, good. See? See? <laughs> you finally got to me. So my, yeah, that's, right. that's how you know I'm the audience in this case, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, you think about if they couldn't think of anything but negative, right. and then you mentioned gratitude right. as, a, as a way to, yeah. um, not bypass, just, just another uh, way to add to that. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about gratitude, practices of gratitude, mm -hmm. or even, uh, okay, uh, so for example, gratitude. If you practice gratitude every single day, yeah. uh, and okay, there you go, this is what I, I remember now, affirmations. Yeah. What's fascinating about it is, and it, on the surface, affirmations seem funky. What's an you have to believe them. You have to believe them. That's the thing. So when we talk about like that exercise that you discussed, right, sort of the gratitude or the positive and the negative, you have to actually believe the positives. Because a lot of times like with the self-help world, they give you affirmations that people don't believe. So it's, I think it's silly to say, I'm beautiful, I'm smart, I'm blah, 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 if I don't believe it. You're not going to believe it by saying it. Well, what's fascinating is um, I've done a lot of that stuff in practice, mm -hmm. and, and especially when I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, of course, you don't. Mm -hmm. believe it but what's interesting is if somebody really did try mm -hmm. to read their affirmations to themselves mm -hmm. and what is an affirmation oh you said it yourself just now you're saying things like um i am strong i'm beautiful i'm intelligent mm -hmm. uh, people like me right, uh, right. <laughs> uh, whatever right. i feel like mr rogers uh, <laughs> uh whatever but uh long story short uh yeah after repeating a lot of those things to myself mm -hmm. it kind of changed slightly because okay. it's strange it, it, it has this little it has a momentum to it i, I feel like even the thoughts somebody has currently mm -hmm. have a momentum to them mm -hmm. but when you start to add these different influences whether it be uh, like for me it was alan watts or something like that mm -hmm. or another thought leader mm -hmm. something along those lines it has this sort of uh, incremental effect on you mm -hmm. that when applied every single day yeah. It doesn't have to be every single day, but for me, I did every single day because I'm just that kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also the kind of person who might go to the gym every single day because I, I can't. And I know people go three, five times a day, uh, three times, uh, three to five times. <laughs> Definitely three to five times a day. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> they go, yeah, three to five times. Quit my job, go to the gym every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, like the way my personality works, I I need to do something every day in order for it to kind of be yeah. instilled in me. So yeah, I noticed that then those things that I was exposing myself to, including the affirmations, uh, had this sort of momentum to it once I practiced it every single day after, uh, you could say after even a month went by. Mm -hmm. um, uh, real quick, uh, there was this one time I, I, I had a depression late college, something like that. I was like 22, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, except for a breakup, whatever. I won't go into too many details. No, just kidding. <laughs> it sounded like I was about to say something. Uh, I hate her. No, 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 no. She's awesome. Awesome. Um, so uh, I was, yeah, I was pretty deep in uh, depression. Uh, objectively, I shouldn't have been, but it I is mean, what it, it is. It doesn't, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. But yeah. then I tried uh, to practicing gratitude mm -hmm. every day for 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and strangely enough, even about maybe a week and a half in, something like that, mm -hmm. I started to feel better. Okay. And then by the time that month was over, I felt like I was re re like restored. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, you can say that uh, I transcended the issue that I had, and so it wasn't like I was restored to my former self. I'm still somebody who had this thing happen to him, right. but decided to think differently. Right. But it felt fantastic, uh, gratitude, and mm -hmm. practicing stuff like that. So, for instance, if somebody is so caught up in their ego, in their thinking, yeah. And let's say they are practicing things like meditation, but these thoughts that they're having are very overwhelming. I would also suggest not just stuff like meditation uh, or exercise, which could get you into a flow state, or other activities that get you into a flow state. Yeah. I would also suggest, yeah, uh, maybe maybe affirmations. Nothing too crazy, like just real, like like ones that maybe uh, could shift wherever you're at currently. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who's uh, overly negative. Yeah. Maybe just inject a little bit of positivity, not to be uh, like a like fairy super Ooh. positive. Yeah, not Ooh. not yeah, <laughs> not on that level. Right. Uh, because again, another form of ego, another yeah. form of uh, and it it has blind spots. You can't be empathetic. Somebody who's too positive mm -hmm. can't be empathetic with some like let's say I, I, there was a time I tried to be super positive. Right. It was it, from my own perspective, it's fantastic. Right. But say somebody had a tragedy happen, right. something like that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just be like, ah, cheer up, or ah, let's talk about something else. Right. Um, it's not good. It's better to empathize, mm -hmm. to see, uh, to, to understand what somebody's feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to be empathetic and to be more of like a grounded person, mm -hmm. it's better to, yeah, to kind of integrate the positive and the negative, mm -hmm. but not be so drawn into one or the other polarity right and um, yeah yeah and so i mean and then in closing like what would you want to say or what do you think like if, you know there's something something important that's something that the audience should take away about the ego what do you think that would be well um i think it would be important to decide not decide uh better to try if you if this is the first time you're hearing about this it would be good to see if you can identify the times when when you're thinking even better to be able to listen to your thoughts mm -hmm. to practice listening to your thoughts mm -hmm. that surprisingly enough that kind of creates a sort of space between you and your thoughts mm -hmm. if they're so they have such a great momentum and they have control over you mm -hmm. by first starting to listen to them and kind of have this view of like the thought is here, but you're looking from like from my vantage view point to like where my hand. I'm trying to do it a visual way. My other hand's on the mic, so I can't do it. Yeah, right. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, having sort of an observer effect uh, like that, um, and also see if you can make a distinction between when you start to get caught up in your thoughts and believe something to be true. Yeah. Uh, and then see if you could just catch yourself in there and then just practice that you might not get it at first but the practice of it has a momentum has an incremental effect that eventually after continuing to practice this you get better and better at it and then you have a sort of a, a shift in perspective if you're somebody who already knows about these concepts um, but you've learned a little bit more probably tell someone else you know about it in a, in a way oh especially if they're interested not don't just um offer up information and it could be you know not their uh, interest at the moment but that's a different story yeah. long story short yeah take away thought yes uh observe the ego and see if you can identify when it's yeah. having an effect on you right. and uh oh and also if, if you, you like, like practice, practice gratitude, gratitude, meditation, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you, you haven't seen our last episode about flow states, check it out. We talk, talk about how to get into a flow state, state which uh, gets you super focused in the moment, uh, uh, in the now, yeah, whatever yeah. way you want to, in the zone, mm -hmm. if you're more comfortable with that. Um, and that also leaves you not uh, thinking so much. Uh, and I'll leave it there because I could talk about it all day. <laughs> for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real, real quick, when I do an exercise, for instance, mm -hmm. I also I go out of my mind. I'm not thinking so much, and that kills the momentum of uh, any automatic thoughts uh, versus brainstorming thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's that. Yeah. And, and I, I think, think it's, it's also important for you guys, for all of us, to really remind ourselves that the ego can be and often is a deceiver. 
So sometimes, you know, kind of we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're much better and we're kind of grandiose than we actually are. And sometimes, and I would say for the most part, we convince ourselves that we're way worse than we actually are. So the point of examining our thoughts and to the point of really sort of examining the ego and what, you know, kind of he or she, whatever you want to call it, says, is to kind of ask yourself, is am I seeing reality as it really is? Because when somebody struggles with depression, they often have, you know, kind of what are, let's say, mm, metaphorically called great colored glasses, right? They sort of see the world through a very sort of, very cynical sort of lens or lens of this. And so the point, I think, yeah. It's to take the lens off. Right, right. And that's, I think, the point of realistic thinking. And sort of the point of the ego and to challenge the ego, which is not necessarily always, I just kind of as a final thought about the ego, right? I think we have this conception in our culture that the ego is sort of, um, that it's inherently grandiose. So it's actually not. Right, so the you ego, have a victim identity. Yeah, exactly. So the ego, I mean, it is in a sense, but it's self-serving, yes, but it's not always grandiose, right? Because yes, if let's say you do kind of perceive yourself as a victim, or you perceive yourself as, you know, or you pity yourself, and you sort of, you're, uh, let's say you kind of see yourself in this woe is me type light, mm -hmm. then no way, I mean, it is self-serving, right? Because then kind of a sense you might feel entitled. You might feel that the world owes you something, right? So you might not feel like you're, let's say, grandiose, but you might feel, well, you know what, because I am so much worse than everybody else or because I have it so much worse off than everybody else then people should take care of me people should pity me people should kind of do these things for me because technically they have way more than I do and that's also not healthy very quick if somebody hears what was just said and has uh, any kind of resistance to it yeah. I would just recommend um, actually stick with that because again, going back to what we said before, anytime you hear something sort of outside your model or your concept right. of reality, you will experience a little bit of resistance. So just, you know, bear with this idea if it's uncomfortable for you, if you do come from that kind of victim mindset. But again, we've had highlighted ways out of that mindset, right. for ways for you to feel better, right. uh, ways for you to contribute. So And then also just to kind of differentiate between the two. So I'm not saying that, let's say, somebody isn't a victim or hasn't been a victim, right? That's not the same thing, right? So when we talk about the label of I am a victim, right? We talk about a globalized term, that I am always a victim, right? That this is just who I am, and that's a really negative mindset, right? So that's why that label is bad. To say that I was a victim of trauma, of rape, right, or some sort of abuse, absolutely real factual, thing. right? That event happened, you were absolutely the victim at that time. But what we're saying is that when you develop sort of that mindset, it's just that what happens is it corrodes your sort of morale. And it corrodes your spirit to the sense of, or to the point of, this is all I am. Right, yeah, because, for example, specifically about the victim mindset, when you identify with being a victim, right. again, there's blind spots to any reality outside of that particular mm -hmm. map or model. Right. Unless when you're hearing this, this is actually getting through to you and you start to kind of open up right. and the ego kind of dissolves slightly. And, right. and your character kind of deepens, you're able to think about things from other perspectives mm -hmm. and it gives you more of a um, grounded view. I understand this is a circle. <laughs> uh, you ground, but that's fine. My body language is not what I just said. But whatever. Right. All right. So, and then just before we end off, I also want to tell you guys that next time on episode three of this great podcast, where right, we're gonna have Jesse Manisto on, and she's uh, she's just what, just a really wonderful person. So she is the founder and the head editor of Third Factor Magazine, and then so she has a really great history because she's worked for the CIA, she's worked for the Consulate of Japan, uh, she's worked for Google, and what? she yeah, and and on top of that, she was also the head editor of the Democratic Socialist. The DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America magazine, Democratic Left. So she's like, she's a really great person, really phenomenal writer, and I can't wait for us to interview her. Cool. Yeah. So, guys, thanks for checking us out. Follow at uh, Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Twitter. But on Twitter, our uh, handle is at Seize underscore uh, podcast if you want to find us on Twitter specifically. Yeah. Uh, oh, we're also on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> podcast, this is where this is going to be uploaded, of course. And uh, yeah, and check out our first episode. And and please leave comments. I mean, we definitely look forward to hearing your feedback because I think we said this in the first episode that this is not supposed to be a definitive show. I mean, there are some things that we absolutely, you know, can say that yes, we know, but then there are way more things that we don't know. And so we really do want to look forward, or we do want to kind of have you guys feedback because we do want to learn and grow from you guys as well. And I think that's the sort of overall theme or point of 100 like right. this is as much educational for us as yeah. it is for you because we're talking about concepts like ego and authenticity it doesn't mean that we're 
man, men on the mountain. Right. Which is awesome yeah. because of the <laughs> article, first mountain man. Versus, like, so we're not speaking from that perspective. Right. Uh, we're also learning just like you are, just trying to throw down ropes because we're coming at it from this particular level. But there's people. It's you shouldn't do it a hierarchy like someone. But there's there's uh, there's a reason why we're trying to contribute and make sure to tell people about this because there's a lot of people who don't know about it. It's not mainstream. Right. There are many people resources that are doing this type of stuff, but we just want to help you and yeah. All right. <laughs> See y'all next time. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>